Good afternoon. My name is Greg Lockwood, and, and on behalf of the team here at the BC Centre for Employment Excellence, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the BC Centre for Employment Excellence, it was created over a year ago with funding from the provincial and federal governments to act as a research and knowledge sharing organization for BC employment service providers and employers. The Centre's mandate is not only to do innovative research, but also to find ways to share the knowledge and best practices with BC practitioners and employers. We created this webinar series as a way to reach out and connect with practitioners. Through this series, we have been highlighting new research by the Centre, but are also tapping into the knowledge and expertise within the employment services community. Mm -hmm. You are invited to view the video recordings of previous webinars that we have posted on our website. Today, we are very pleased to feature Shauna McPherson and Corrine Richardson of the University of the Fraser Valley's Department of Adult Education. Shauna McPherson is the new department head in adult education at the University of the Fraser Valley and has extensive adult education experiences in Canada in the areas of adult ESL and teacher education and in India in the areas of EFL, environmental health and refugee education with Punjabi and Tibetan refugee students. She received her PhD from UBC in 2000, completed a postdoc at the University of Alberta and later served as associate professor in education at the University of Manitoba and president of Teaching English to Adults in Manitoba. In 2008, she assumed a post as an adjunct faculty with the Institute of Asian Research at UBC, as an instructor at BCIT, and later as coordinator of ELSA-NET. Recently, she served as lead curriculum designer or consultant on three major adult ESL curriculum design projects in BC for newcomers. Shauna has published widely on the impact of globalization on education and sustainability, including a 2011 book with Rulage on Education and Sustainability, based on Shirk-funded research on the Tibetan diaspora in Canada, the USA, and India. In addition, she has published widely on Shirk-funded Shirk study of intercultural teaching and diversity. Kareen Richardson is an experienced educator and a committed advisor for the Adult Education Department at UFV. Her extensive fashion industry background led to teaching in this specialized field. Kareen's interest in professional life has steered her to develop and deliver training sessions for a variety of organizations and to serve on many fashion boards and advisory councils. Kareen's focus has shifted to the University of the Fraser Valley, where she earned a bachelor's degree in adult education, developed a successful fashion design program, and is currently enjoying working in the adult education program. Her very life experiences contribute to an understanding of the diversity of opportunities for adult learners and the importance of workplace training. So before I turn it over to Shauna and Kareen, uh, let's cover a few housekeeping items. The presentation will last approximately 45 minutes. Due to the high number of participants, we will be muting the audience throughout the presentation to ensure audio quality. We encourage you to use uh, the questions feature on your dashboard to submit any comments and questions. I'll be compiling the questions for Shauna and Kareen to respond to throughout the presentation. Uh, and we'll also have 10 minutes at the end for further discussion. We continue to experiment using the raise hands feature. So if you have a microphone during the discussion at any time, simply raise your hand and we will unmute you. We are recording the webinar and we'll post the video on our website with further opportunities for everyone to continue the conversation. If you lose your connection, uh, your internet connection during the presentation, please reconnect using the link mailed to you. And if you lose your phone connection, redial the phone number, which appears under the info tab and rejoin. And now it is my pleasure to hand it over to um, Shauna and Kareen. And I've just realized we have a poll uh, that we set up um, uh, ahead, of the, ahead of the webinar. So I think I'm just gonna take about a minute um, and launch that poll. So please just, um, Hopefully that will show up for you on your screens. It's a question, uh, are you familiar with the prior learning assessment and recognition PAR process? And uh, we'll give you about a minute to answer the poll and then I'll hand it over to Shauna and Green. Okay, Shauna and Kareen, so I've unmuted you, and just to let you know about the results of the poll, uh, it's, it's about a 60-40 split, so 60% of our audience was not 
familiar with PLAR, and about 40% uh, of participants today are familiar with the PLAR process. So there you go. Take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Greg, for that information. Uh, can you see the screen or PowerPoint? We certainly can. Great. Uh, so this particular presentation, we're going to focus on prior learning assessment and recognition, or PLAR, opportunities at the University of the Fraser Valley for career practitioners and clients. What we'll do initially, though, is give an overview of PLAR uh, processes in Canada and the United States. Um, sorry, in Canada and British Columbia in particular. Uh, in addition to the background Greg gave uh, about my interest in this topic, I would add that I serve on the board of BC Plan, the BC Prior Learning Action Network, and head the training subcommittee. Uh, so the first uh, idea I'll just throw out there is a quote I like to think about by Mark Twain to consider what we're doing with PLAR, and as he said, I never let schooling interfere with my education. Uh, so hopefully we all understand that concept, and PLAR is really uh, a process that's attempting to address this challenge in uh, uh, schooling interfering with education. We're trying to get it so that schooling is more uh, integrated with our education, as in our lifelong education. So the first question we might have is, what is PLAR? Uh, if this is a term used in Canada. It's referred to uh, in other ways around the world. Uh, what PLAR refers to literally is prior learning assessment and recognition. And one of the problems with that particular way of viewing it is that it, it's focused on prior or previous learning when in fact it could be ongoing. So in Europe, for instance, if I'm not mistaken, at least in parts of Europe, they tend to refer to it as RPL, which is recognition of prior learning, or others refer to it as recognition of informal learning. Um, in the context of Canada and BC and UFE in particular, PLAR refers to the systematic assessment of formal learning uh, in the form of credit coursework that is you're unable to transfer for whatever reason into a, an academic program or it could be the workplace. Uh, the recognition or assessment of non-formal learning, uh, which refers to formal classroom learning but in non-credit programs like continuing education uh, or workplace learning. And finally, to the assessment of informal learning which is uh, what Mark Twain was alluding to. Uh, the learning we have, in, in for the unstructured learning we have outside of classrooms, in the workplace, or through traveling and life experiences. Uh, and the idea is that this assessed learning uh, of non-credit of, of non -credit or unrecognized credit uh, programs be recognized for credit in post-secondary institutions or for credentialing in the workplace. I would say those are the two predominant areas that PLAR is being applied right now. In Canada, uh, we uh, tend to use PLAR to assess post-secondary education for mid-career professionals or workplace or workers. Uh, so you find it tends to be focused on block or course by course credit recognition uh, for academic programs or by industry to recognize the value of on the job or experiential learning uh, that may not have been delivered through a formal education process or certificate. Uh, right now, there's a strong emphasis on using PLAR to support newcomers to Canada who are trying to re-enter their professions or trades, where their varied uh, backgrounds, whether it's formal education, non-formal or informal, uh, don't exact, aren't recognized by the professional associations or trades when they enter. So this is an important area of 
of the application of PAR right now. And it's reflected in the fact that Citizenship and Immigration Canada has just given a significant grant to the national organization, CAPLA, the Canadian Association of Prior Learning Assessment, to uh, do research on the development of quality assurance standards for assessors, people who assess and do PAR for newcomers entering Canada. So for this audience, I think it's really important to understand that this is the new horizon of employment activity in Canada, is that especially of newcomers, but also Canadians, will tend to be increasingly subjected to a PLAR process to identify gaps in their background for particular occupations, and then provided training in the gaps to enter that profession without having to redo all their credentials in an institution, an educational institution. It may involve an educational institution, but it'll target the gaps. So again, the emphasis here is on the transfer uh, and, and providing more pathways and more fluid pathways across formal academic and workplace or lifelong learning environments. So we're really trying to support through PLAR more fluidity across those boundaries, which in the past have been fairly rigid. So what types of learning count as PLAR? We discussed formal, uh, formal learning. This could be, why would someone not want to have formal education recognized in PLAR. Usually that's done through transfer, so you don't have to go through a formal PLAR. But the problem is that a lot of international diplomas, degrees, or coursework are not recognized for uh, formal transfer and therefore require uh, additional uh, recognition through a PLAR process. Uh, and uh, the more common, though, is the recognition of non-formal education. So that would be any coursework someone might do or training that is not, uh, doesn't have a credit value appended to it. So it might be continuing education courses or workplace or industry training, community education workshops, these types of activities. Finally, it's about recognizing informal learning, which might be work experience, travel experience, life experience, um, running a business, independent studies you might have done uh, on your own. So understanding that that's the kind of learning we're trying to recognize formally, both for academic environments and for credentialing for workplace, the question is, how do we process PAR? How do we uh, engage in an a assessment of prior learning uh, in order for it to be recognized by these formal institutions or credentialing environments? So the first thing to always bear in mind, and we can't uh, state enough of, is that it's based on a shift to a competency-based framework. So for example, instead of talking about doing English 100 or do you have English 100 to prove that you have basic or good literacy skills, we would say, are you able to communicate well interpersonally? Are you able to write memos? Are you able to um, you know, do adequate, uh, perform with adequate grammar? These types of outcomes are identified rather than saying, do you have English 100? So English 100 might carry those outcomes, but the point is that it's defined by competencies rather than by a, a particular course or credential, for instance. Uh, so all industries, all professions, all institutions of higher education are being asked to shift to a competency-based framework that's really setting the groundwork for this fluidity in the recognition of competencies across these target contexts. Uh, so 
in this case, of course, we're focusing, uh, PLAR would focus on occupational or academic disciplines uh, being recognized as competencies. And often in post-secondary, it's referred to as outcomes, an outcomes-based model. But those outcomes aren't supposed to be that you read, you uh, have read Shakespeare, although that might be a content knowledge, but it's more that it's a specific competency, like the ability to write an essay, say, in an academic environment. Um, so the competencies are identified as having been met with evidence. So that's what the assessment is doing. The competencies are clearly established by the various agencies involved. And then the assessment compares the uh, competencies, uh, the, sorry, the, the person's uh, work experience or background against these competencies. Uh, and they have to provide evidence that they have met the, each of the competencies. So it's often done through a portfolio, uh, especially in academic environments, for instance, or through on-the-job gap analysis, which is really a test process. In the trades you find, it could be a three-day test of the various competencies where the candidate has to prove that they can do the various tasks associated with that trade. So for instance, right now in BC Plan, uh, as I said, I'm on the board of this organization, um, we have a good balance between representatives from post-secondary environments in British Columbia and representatives from industry, uh, for instance, the construction industry and the aviation industry, both of which are highly motivated and interested in supporting um, a PLAR process into those uh, trades or occupations. Uh, our focus right now as an organization uh, or one key focus is developing training standards for assessors. So the people who will engage in these assessments of uh, people, uh, whether in academic or industrial environments. Uh, so we want to know what kind of background would an assessor need and what kind of training can we provide to ensure that they'll meet those basic standards and that we were hoping that when someone is assessed, let's say they're assessed in a trade, it would be recognized as much by a post-secondary institution, like say BCIT for higher certification, as it would be by the trade that's hiring those, uh, those uh, people who were assessed. Uh, likewise, we're trying to develop at UFV in the Adult Education Department, a PLAR assessor certificate that would be a certain combination of our courses that are part of our degree already or would be added to it that would provide that uh, assessment uh, training and credential. Uh, but it could be provided by other institutions in BC as well. We just want to make sure that we're harmonizing the outcomes that any certified trainer would have, sorry, certified assessor, PAR assessor would have. So just to uh, uh, close up on this section of the talk, uh, I thought to give a few examples of um, what might you might find interesting uh, to understand how PAR is applied. The first case I just heard about um, on another board, and um, <clears throat> this is the case uh, that apparently BC Hydro is hiring most of its power line technicians who repair our power lines when they fall down, like they just did in Chilliwack two weeks ago at my house. Uh, so apparently that's a very specific skill. Uh, to do effectively, quickly, and not to get electrocuted in the process. And uh, there's a shortage of people with this training in uh, British Columbia. It has a red seal training associated with it. Um, there is a training program in NATE, the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, but their grads are quickly scooped up to work you know, in Fort McMurray or by Hydro in Alberta. So what BC Hydro been doing is recruiting 
out of the U.S. or internationally. So a lot of Filipinos are being trained, for instance, uh, or prepared or uh, um, um, hired to serve as power line technicians in northern BC. So what they do is they bring them in and they give them a three-day test and they have the competency list required of this power line technician position and they compare their skills against it and if there's a narrow enough gap they can be hired and the training or the gap addressed through training and then they step into a job which to my understanding is very um, generous. I, I believe it's one of those um, BC Hydro jobs that's in excess of $100,000, but I can't say for certain, but it's very well paid. So it's a, a quite a high stakes uh, activity, as you can imagine, um, for these newcomers. And um, uh, they don't have to step back and go to NATE or to a, a formal institution to get this credential. They can have their skills recognized. Uh, another example I'll give you came from our program at UFB. So that was an example of an industry application of PLAR. An example of an academic uh, application is in our program in adult ed, where we are, are very unique, in, even internationally, in offering uh, a credential, uh, a, a, a BA, a degree, uh, that, that recognizes up to 45 credits in block transfer. What that means is people don't have to transfer course by course. Instead, they can prove that they have the competencies of an adult educator through their work experience, their unrecognized formal, non-formal, and informal learning. And so consequently, we are very attractive to people who work in paraprofessional professions. Uh, who have often college training or diplomas, uh, but are rising to higher levels of instructional positions within those areas. So for instance, we had one of the leading paramedics instructors in Alberta, who works for the government of Alberta, who did our program. And he was able to complete it in a fairly short duration, I believe two years, because he had sufficient transfer credit, and then he was able to PLAR 15 credits in his case. Um, into his program and graduated in the spring uh, with a Dean's Medal, in fact, for highest academic achievement, uh, which paves the way for him to do graduate work as well if he so chooses. So I thought those were two good examples to show both an industry application and an uh, academic application of PLAR. So now I'll pass it on to Corinne, who will talk more specifically about PLAR in our uh, BA program and in the certificate at UFB. Hello, everybody. Hi there, Corinne and Sean. It's Greg here. So, what would you see? Hi. Hey, well, I'm just going. How are you? I'm just going to uh, to jump in with a question from one of our uh, audience members here. Oh yes. Um, and they're asking if. PLAR will be replacing the current international credential evaluation services. Um, so currently new immigrants are being directed there by institutions for evaluating their transcripts and degrees, etc. This is at the BCIT campus. So are you familiar with international credential evaluation services and how I, uh, PLAR relates to that? Uh, yes, I, I can't speak to the policy shift in the government because of course uh, that I don't know that, um, but this a PLAR process would never replace a credential recognition process in my, my estimation. Some people have suggested it might, but as you can imagine, if you can just transfer in an international credential immediately without having to undergo a test or a, a, um, a portfolio assessment, it's probably an easier model. So my guess is that uh, the credentialing process, the recognition of actual credentials from formal uh, education internationally, that will still continue because it's easier. Uh, it could be in high stakes trades like power line technicians, for instance, even with those uh, credentials recognized, they still may be subject 
to uh, this skills analysis as they are right now. Um, it may be such, you know, nurses, I believe, still have that in Canada where even if the credentials are recognized, they have to prove competency in the language. So you're going to get a meshing of rec formal recognition of language um, through a combined PLAR and um, testing process um, with the PLAR, the skills assessment, with the recognition of formal credentials. I think these three streams are going to start being more integrated. I don't think PLAR, personally, I don't think PLAR is going to replace this prudential recognition, international prudential recognition process. Okay, thank you. And another question, sort of along those same lines, um, a participant is asking if PLAR for lifelong learning, informal learning, um, would it be aided by the adoption of a national skills competency qualifications framework such as exists in Europe? Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with what was being referred to there, and if so, why, okay, why do you think Canada doesn't currently have such a system? Uh, I, I, it's an excellent question, and I think we're headed there. So I, I think this is why CIC has started to fund uh, quality standards for assessors. Uh, I think we are heading in that direction, okay. following Europe. Great. And final question, just uh, on one of the acronyms I believe that was used earlier, G GAP or GAP? Is that an acronym or are we just referring to actually <laughs> a gap in, I think it was skills or competencies? Yes. Yes, it is not an acronym. Okay. <laughs> it refers to actual gap. Actual gap. It is the term that is used ubiquitously or commonly is to refer to it as a gap analysis or okay. training to the gap. Um, okay. Thank and you. it's not an acronym. Okay. Although that's a good idea. Maybe <laughs> make it an acronym. There you go. Okay, so I'll, I'll mute myself and, and let you take it away, Corinne. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. So, uh, again, why study at UFE? Well, uh, we're Western Canada's only undergrad program in adult education. We have flexible online and blended formats. And what we mean by that is that we have students coming from all over the place, they're long distance, uh, so they can uh, participate in our uh, courses. We do have some face-to-face -face time, and even though they're long distance, they're able to participate because they're able to use WebEx and be part of the team and part of the, the course and the um, uh, working with groups, so it, it works out really well. We actually have, uh, for example, we have somebody right now from uh, Stewart, BC, who's in a, a course that we're taking right, are, are offering right now. So we do have students from all over. So we also, what we mean by flexible is oh, these face-to-face -face times are done around work schedules. So they're 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 presented on a Saturday or after hours. So we're really uh, cognizant of the fact that people are working, that a lot of our students are mid-career students, and so we have to accommodate those and be flexible around those schedules. Um, we are, Fraser Valley is com community development focused, so we really look towards our, our local community, community and beyond, being able to offer uh, timely courses um, and uh, be able to uh, meet the requirements of our, our community. Um, our courses are projects and skilled and applied focus, so it's not just sit sitting listening to a, a, a lecturer that we really look at projects that are focused to workplace environments, um, that they're relative to workplace environments, that they develop the skills that are uh, needed in the workplace, and uh, and that can be applied to the workplace. And I know that personally because of the I've just been a graduate of the program myself, and I was able to create uh, a whole program based on the the skills that I developed on with the courses that I had taken here. So it's all very relevant and appropriate. Uh, there are PLAR, as we said, PLAR opportunities, so 45 credits plus can be applied to your program. So we have pathways in our program. The BA in the adult education is designed to serve mid-career professionals, as we talked about. So the interesting thing about that is as you're in classes and in courses with people, 
you're seeing their lives and you're able to understand how all the skills that you're de developing and competencies that you're developing, how they're applying it to their real work life and how that may work with you also. So you really do share with your colleagues in your classroom what they're doing, how they're applying it, and how that might work with your environment. There's a strong experience and skills. It is working for strong experiences and developing skills, uh, but for missing credentials. So if you're missing some credentials, we're really working on your experience and your skills. Um, we also working for international credentials that aren't people who, who have international credentials, but they're not recognized. So we're looking at that and, and helping them fit into the program, understanding that they have uh, uh, skill sets that, that can be recognized within our program. And of course, the pathways is for anybody interested in an adult ed career. So who benefits from the adult ed, uh, the adult ed BA, or from the um, adult ed workplace training certificate? Well, employment counselors, ESL instructors, any multicultural family service workers, settlement workers, and skill development instructors. And so with that, people that are uh, also their clients that they're, they're serving and um, you know, any uh, people that are working within that realm and are being able to uh, help people develop their skills, also help yourself uh, create programs. I worked also in an HR environment where people were always doing training. They were training in different sectors, so they are always looking at enhancing their skills. So this would be something also people would be looking for. The UFA Adult Ed Department, the PAR policy is as such. Uh, the Adult Ed Department for the BA, we expect 120 credits to be earned uh, in order to get the BFA. But up to 90, the BA, but up to 90 credits can be transferred from other post-secondary studies, other degrees that you've taken, diploma programs, and I advise people to be very careful. Sometimes we forget where we got our training. Sometimes we get people who apply to the program and forget, oh, I, I did take some training at this post-secondary. I forgot all about it. So we really encourage you to think carefully about all the post-secondary training that you've had and credentials that you've earned. And make sure that you, uh, when you apply to the program, that you have those transcripts sent to us. And also consider your non-informal uh, training that you have. Uh, and include that when you speak to me or email me, and we can uh, work towards making sure that we get you on the path to have those uh, credentials uh, looked at. So in the Adult Ed BA, up to 45 block credits can be applied to the lower level credits or electives which is a tremendous start um, for uh, students. And I'm going to give you a story about a student that came in. He had uh, some credentials that were non-related to the, his career. He ended up getting a position within this organization, and he moved up the ranks very quickly. But then he's gotten to such a position right now that he realized that he needs to have some credentials. So he has. Uh, approached us and has uh, come into our program and he's in the process of getting PLAR. He will easily gain those credits because of his post-secondary uh, uh, experiences will be one of it, but also because of his work-life experiences and where he's, uh, he's put programs together, things like that. So he has administered those uh, programs. He has done a lot of work, but very quickly he would be able to move through the BA program. So I'll just step in here to um, refer to uh, the process. 
to, to understand that our block credits are awarded through a competency-based portfolio assessment. So as I pointed out, all PLAR is based on a comp competency-based framework, and we likewise use that process. But students don't have to prove demonstrated that they've met course outcomes. Instead, the competencies are based on the profession or field of adult education, which people demonstrate they've met through a portfolio. Um, and uh, when they enter, if they want, if if a student or candidate wishes to apply for PLAR recognition, we would ask that they complete one of our courses, which they can use towards uh, their degree, it's for three credits, uh, on portfolio design to prepare a portfolio for PLAR assessment. It's called Adult Education 305. Um, they would then, in the context of that course, prepare a portfolio identifying that they've met the adult education competencies that we have identified and provide evidence of having done so. They would pay for a maximum of 75% of 12 credits, which you can see is nine credits, um, for up to the 45 credits. Uh, so it's a significant savings as well on what they would have to pay if they had done all the credit uh, credits in a classroom. Uh, so uh, here are a few examples, for instance, of PLAR students we processed this year. Um, that one, uh, one woman worked in uh, settlement services with refugees, for example, uh, and her work in that environment combined with some uh, uh, work in a small business amounted to recognition of 36 credits. Another woman uh, had was a long-term special education assistant, assistant and a small business owner who was able to earn 30 credits. Another uh, person uh, from uh, the Fraser Valley region or Mission, I think, or Maple Ridge was a health and safety trainer and a consultant uh, who actually had no post-secondary uh, in her case, for instance, uh, but her experience in the workplace was very strong and she earned 35 credits towards her degree. Uh, so this diagram, I won't go into any detail, but I just wanted you to see it to understand uh, a competency framework, what it might look like. So actually, uh, we identified kind of generic adult education competency domains, which were in part based on the Canadian Council of Learning National Study on Competencies in the Field of Adult Education. So this is often how it's done. You reference a national certification or professional body that identifies the competencies. So it's not like everyone has to reinvent it. But we use that as a framework, and then we identified we also had to align, I might add, with University of Fraser Valley developed 11 institutional learning outcomes. So we aligned the professional outcomes with the institutional learning outcomes, and they aligned well. And then we uh, included our 13 competencies that students can use towards PLAR, towards those 45 credits. And we added another 11, I believe, or nine, uh, nine competencies um, that were, in a sense, value added through the process of completing the BA. Uh, so the bottom group of competencies include the PLAR competencies as well as competencies in adult education through the degree. So I've included that for you to look at, but I won't go into detail. So we also have, and this certificate is designed for other than going for the four-year degree program, which we do have a lot of interest for. We have people that have um, really, that, that is what they're doing. They really want to just take the four courses, be able to have the certificate, and, um, and then they can make a decision if they choose to go further. But some people feel that a long, protracted degree isn't for them. They really want the certificate. But we also offer a, a twofer, 
And what we mean by that is that students can also choose uh, the, to go further once they've achieved that certificate if they decide to. So what are the key adult education programs offered at UFB? Well, we have an adult education department, of course, at the university. Um, and in that is the adult education workplace a certificate training we were just discussing and also the BA in the adult education. And they are integrated, embedded. So for example, the certificate course, we offer a four, three credit certificate course. The courses are um, Adult Ed 320, which is adult learning, Adult Ed 4, 340, which is the program planning and evaluation, the Adult Ed 407, which is Organizational Workplace Learning. The Adult Ed 408, Assessing Adult Learning. So those are key components of our BA program. But you can see that that is a pretty comprehensive certificate that you would have for um, the workplace certificate. On completing the certificate, just to remind you, all of those four courses are part of the degree program, and your courses will transfer to the degree should you decide to pursue it at a later date. Or you could be in the degree program and not realizing that you really get two. You would graduate with the degree as well as having the certificate because the two uh, courses are together. The same courses in the certificate are in the degree program. So I'll just continue on that we've done our blended, our online courses, that you can come by WebEx, uh, participate by WebEx, uh, part-time hours, evenings, weekends, and of course, uh, you know, again, to work around your busy schedules. Um, we really do uh, look at the optimal recognition of workplace learning. The trajectory of all our courses work on developing effective leadership and adult educational uh, professionals. This is just for you to look at in future. It just shows different types of career trajectories uh, people might consider or gain from in doing a BA in adult education. Um, these are the entrance requirements. They're very basic. We're basically uh, encouraging people our program to serve as an access program, so it's basically grade 12 and English language proficiency requirements, um, which are the basic requirements for UFD. Here is an outline of the program uh, requirements for your information. You can also find more detail on our website, so, which might be an easier way to uh, understand it. Uh, also, you are welcome to call In. She's an excellent source. And if a non-formal continuing education or other formal institutions, it's uh, we're set at just over $400 for three credits and the reduced cost of PLAR. And of course, transfer credits are done free of charge, as is the custom in uh, BC. Uh, so do you have any questions? Okay, uh, thanks Thanks so much, Shauna and Karen. We do have a few question, questions that came in. Um, uh, one participant was asking if students can use the chart that you referred to a few slides ago of adult ed competencies to build their portfolio, or do they have to take the AD305 as a prere prerequisite? Yes, they do. We uh, They do have to take the AD305 uh, to go with it. And I really suggest that people seriously consider it because it's so helpful. I don't know about anybody else, but for me, I need the, uh, the uh, structure of a classroom to sort of get my material together. And having an instructor remind you of where you could place a certain evidence or how you can gain, maximize your credits by considering all the things that you have done 
and be able to evidence it in such a way that you can maximize your credits is the uh, best way to go. So again, and there, plus you get another three credits. Here, um, I, under this program, there may be concerns that uh, you won't get adequate PAR recognition, but in fact, uh, everyone who's applied for PAR in our program has received the minimum number of credits they've required and often close to the maximum they've requested. So because we're rigorous in supporting students through the process, usually our students do have an adequate background and make realistic requests. Um, and so if you don't have the course, though, you may not design your portfolio properly or understand how you could actually meet some competencies that you think you don't have. Uh, you know, the special ed assistant, for instance, was supporting teachers in the classroom and didn't realize she had developed a certain set of facilitation skills. So she understood that through the course. So we feel it's a win-win and students don't need to be supported or face uh, failure through the PAR process by doing this course. Okay, um, and next question here is, um, is there a time limit? on, uh, sorry, I'm just bringing up the question here again. Is there a time limitation on past post-secondary credits being submitted for PAR consideration? No, there isn't. No, there isn't. So once you get your transcripts in, uh, when you apply to the program and you get your transcripts in, it goes through our credential uh, evaluators and they look at it and we've had uh, transcripts from a way back. Uh, so as long as they're, uh, if it's very dated and uh, they need extra information, they will contact the student and help them find the information. But uh, we've had transcripts from a way back. Okay. Uh, just to clarify, though, there's a confusion I want to clarify in that question, uh, which I needed to emphasize more, obviously. The transfer process, transfer credit process is not a PLAR process, right? So the transfer credit process doesn't require a PLAR assessment. That's done automatically, and uh, the only reason you would ever include uh, a transfer issue in a PLAR is because it was refused. It wouldn't be refused because it was old. Sometimes international uh, formal credentials are rejected though because of uh, the institution. But those could be included in a PLAR. Okay. Um, so uh, with the PLAR process, we don't view it as stated. The PLAR, it is your work experience. If you did it 20 years ago, it's equally as valid as if you did it last year. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, much uh, Shauna and Kareen. Um, I think we had a couple of more questions that came in. So any further questions that, uh, that, that you have out there, please feel free to send them, either um, in the remaining few minutes here or um, in the blog post, which will go on the Center for Employment Excellence website later today. And uh, hopefully, uh, Shauna and Kareen will be would be uh, would be able to make themselves available to answer those questions. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Wonderful. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and um, and wrap up the presentation of the webinar for today. Um, so thanks again to Shauna and Kareen. Uh, for the presentation today, which we saw from the poll, has, has introduced the PLAR process to many of you. And thanks to all of you for attending the webinar today. The session was recorded. Uh, we will post the video of the presentation on our website and continue the conversation there. And again, thanks very much for your patience, uh, for hanging in there through those audio difficulties at the end. I think for, for most of you, the, the audio was quite clear for the majority of the presentation. Um, so hopefully uh, um, it didn't pose too much of an issue. Um, you will receive an email shortly with a link to the presentation and video. Unfortunately, we have found that the system does not record those of you connecting only by phone as having attended. So you may receive an email saying that we're sorry you were unable to attend. So if that's the case and you would like a confirmation of your attendance, please contact me uh, at the address in the email. Uh, many of you have asked um, for Corinne and Shauna's um, 
contact information. I don't think it was um, shown on, on uh, the slides today, but certainly we will um, make that contact information available um, so you can, you can get in touch with them. Uh, as always, we welcome your input and feedback. So, of course, we know uh, about the audio issues today, and, and we'll work on those for the next um, the next time. But if you have any suggestions for further webinar topics, uh, please let us know. Uh, we, we'd love to hear your suggestions. One last note before we end for today. Uh, many of you are already aware, but the BCCDA's 17th Annual Career Development Conference, in partnership with the BC Centre for Employment Excellence, is taking place on March 7th and 8th in Richmond, BC. Uh, this year's conference will feature a Center for Employment Excellence stream. More details about that as well as the entire conference program and registration can be found on both the BCCDA and Center for Employment Excellence websites. Um, one session in this year's uh, Center for Employment Excellence stream is titled, Can Essential Skills Training in the Workplace Make a Difference? It will feature some of you know, ground, some groundbreaking work being done in this area by Social Research and Demonstration Corporation, Douglas College, and many others. So take a look at, at that session and the descriptions for all of the other sessions, uh, which you can find on the websites. Um, so that ends our webinar for today. On behalf of the BC Centre for Employment Excellence, thank you and have a great afternoon.